use these five strategies to maximize every single exercise you do in the gym to get the most out of every rep you do in the gym. In this video, I'm going to teach you exactly how to get the most out of every single rep you perform in the gym when it comes to maximizing hypertrophy, muscle growth. The reason I wanted to create this video is because I feel that a lot of the everyday lifters I interact with on social media, YouTube, podcast listeners, our clients, whoever it may be, they have difficulty identifying their weak links in the gym. And those weak links often really prevent them from making the most out of their training. Because if you just have a few weak links that are stacked on top of each other and you consistently train in a slightly suboptimal way, you could be leaving so much progress left on the table by the end of the year. So my goal with this video is to teach you what those weak links most commonly are, how to identify them, and then how to fix them so you can maximize every single rep, every single exercise, and every single workout you do to accumulate more volume, more productive training, and of course, better results by the end of each week and month and eventually year. Now, when I think about these weak links specifically, there are a few that come to mind as the big red flags or the most common ones I often see with the clients we work with and with the people who engage with my content on social media. These weak links that these normal lifters tend to run into start with junk volume. Then we see a lot of poor levels of effort overall. So just not training hard enough a lot of suboptimal exercise selection. So just literally choosing the wrong exercises for that person individually. And last but not least, inaccurately applied tension. So doing an exercise, but maybe not actually applying the tension in the right area or the right way to get the most out of the muscle they are targeting. And I'm gonna elaborate on each of these individually. Um, and we're gonna start with junk volume because truthfully, junk volume is kind of like an umbrella term. And it's, it's pretty much what it sounds like. It's just wasted volume. Volume being work done in the gym. So it is training you are actively doing in the gym but it is junk because it is not getting used properly. You're not getting the most out of the volume you're doing. It's technically a waste per se. And maybe it's not all a waste. If you're a beginner and you're doing something in the gym, I don't even care if you're swinging the dumbbell. If you're doing something, you're probably applying some kind of resistance to the muscle. And if you're brand new to lifting, it will force growth because you're brand new and anything works like most of us know. But as you become an intermediate lifter and an advanced lifter, you cannot just go do junk volume. You're gonna get hurt, you're not gonna build the right muscles, and you're gonna be very confused as to why you're going to the gym over and over and over again, yet do not look like you work out whatsoever. Further digging into junk volume is that it's really taxing still, and it still causes a lot of fatigue, um, as if it was stimulative training, but it's not stimulative training. See, the problem is that when you go into the gym and you do junk volume, you might be tiring yourself out. You're fatiguing yourself neurologically and potentially even on the skeletal system, being your joints, also your tendons and ligaments, so on and so forth. So you go in and you, you do this exhaustive training that still burns you out, gets you tired, increases fatigue, but it's not stimulative, meaning it's not doing anything productive. You're not stimulating a muscle to grow. You're just going in and kind of hitting a muscle, but really just tiring yourself out. So what if we could remove the junk volume, get just as tired because training is hard work and it's tiring, you can't get away from that, but we could do it with stimulative work that's very directed towards what you're actually trying to accomplish in the gym. That sounds a lot better to me. So an example of this is pretty simple. Let's say you're doing three sets of bicep curls, but you're doing a weight that's far too heavy. When you're doing this weight, you're, you're trying to swing it up. So your initial bicep curl starts with like this gyration of your hips. So you're kind of pumping the air to get the momentum going. Then you're leaning back. Now I'm leaning back and I'm actually hyperextending my back, which actually trains my erectors, right? My spinal erectors are on fire now, my lower back. Sometimes that causes pain. Sometimes that's good for you if you're <laughs> doing it on purpose. So now we're halfway through a curl and we've only worked our hips and our lower back. It's not a good start. Then as it gets about halfway, we have to kind of shrug because like the weight's too heavy and we don't want to break our elbow because the tension applied to the elbow joint is crazy right now. So I'm shrugging too and I get my traps fired. And then maybe at the very end, I get like a inch of a curl. So you get a little bit of bicep and a whole lot of everything else. Maybe you control the weight down and get some biceps on the negative, whatever. But the point is, is now I've just caused a bunch of tension potentially on muscles elsewhere that I wasn't planning on targeting, also tension on specific joints that I don't wanna cause tension on. And I've definitely applied a lot of stress on the tendons and ligaments of my elbow because the weight is far too heavy for me to create stability and actually go through a functional range of motion. 
this is a perfect example of junk volume. And I'm sure you've seen people in the gym. And if you haven't, you've definitely seen memes of people in the gym on TikTok or Instagram, where these people are doing the weirdest exercise variations or just terrible form when you know they shouldn't be lifting that heavy. Be that like the guy doing shrugs in the Smith machine or, or the squat rack and it looks like he's having a seizure in there or the guy that's doing a leg press and it's just like little tiny pumps of his legs. None of that is, a, is very effective and it's almost always overloaded to a degree that is unnecessary, which is gonna cause tension and stress that is not needed. Now, to get back to the productive nature of this piece of content, Using junk volume more so as an umbrella term, meaning like there's there's subcategories underneath what junk volume is, we can dive into three main training mistakes people make. And the first one is effort, poor effort. Plain and simple, you're just not training hard enough um, and it's probably what's holding you back in the gym. In fact, I see a lot of people that this is exactly why they're not making progress in the gym. Even on paper, they're following a great program. Maybe even a suboptimal program from a standpoint of it looks like they're doing too much, but they're not under recovered and they're not growing. Well, it's because on paper they have enough, if not too much volume, but when they go to the gym, they're training like a wimp. They're not actually getting after it and they're not pushing themselves close to failure. And that is what we need to do in order to stimulate growth to happen on the muscular level. So if we think about what research has shown, we know that we need to get near failure in order to fully stimulate and optimally build muscle tissue. More specifically, the distance between your last rep and the total failure needs to be around one to three reps away. Meaning if failure is here and my last rep is here and there's three reps in between that distance, I'm in a good place. Even better if it's only two reps, even better if it's even one. And sometimes there's a reason to go all the way to failure. We know that failure training is the most stimulative training for muscle growth. Meaning if you take a, a muscle to absolute failure, you are more likely to cause it to grow. Now, going all the way to failure, especially when you do it too often or with exercises that have a higher injury risk or a higher neurological component of fatigue, it's probably, you know, too, it's not... The risk isn't worth the reward. You might stimulate the muscle to grow, but you're also taking way longer to recover and potentially hurting yourself in the process, which is why we don't always wanna to go to failure, especially on big lifts, but rather we wanna stay within a certain proximity to failure, which is almost even more difficult. It takes more mental strength to go all the way to failure because you gotta push past comfort. However, to get to the brink of failure and stop just shy of it is a very difficult thing. It's a skill that you develop over time, which means you gotta work on this. But if you can do that, you're gonna be much better off than what you're doing right now, which is training like a pansy. You're just not training hard enough, plain and simple. And so this proximity to failure is difficult for some people to actually actualize and, and put it into real effect in their training because they haven't experienced that. So if you've never taken a set to failure, pick an easy exercise to do it with and go all the way to failure. Because if you've never been to failure, you don't know how to stay a certain distance away from failure. And not training hard enough is what's holding you back if this category is your kryptonite for your results. And that also means that you're too far away, which means that you haven't got close enough. And that means you just don't have enough experience or enough skin in the game doing heavy lifts close to failure. So point being in all this, you gotta train harder. Research shows it, and we're gonna dive into how you can actually track this and how you can optimize your training to make sure you're not failing all the time, but you're failing enough of the time or just getting close enough to squeeze out just as much progress without having the downsides of over training and under recovering or potentially hurting yourself in the process of trying to build muscle. The next red flag or issue we see with people making in the gym is suboptimal exercise selection. So this is a very individualized aspect of the training process. And when someone is getting this part wrong, it can be difficult for them to pinpoint exactly how to fix it because you might not know why you would need to choose one exercise versus the other. See, the thing is with exercise selection is it comes down to a lot of different variables. Um, but if we look at some of these variables and some spe uh, key specific indicators, we can absolutely pinpoint what exercises are gonna work best for you versus me versus anybody else. And when you can use those, you can actually nail down exactly what your training program should look like and how to progress with it optimally. And to make it even more simple, think of it like this. If you and I are both doing a squat and I am feeling it tremendously in my quads, which is what I want, and you're feeling it tremendously in your lower back and your hamstrings, something's off here. I'm saying this is the best quad builder. You're saying this is a terrible quad builder and it just hurts. 
it's not because the squat is not good for quads. It's because the squat isn't good for your quads. It's great for my quads, but that's based on my femur length. It's based on my torso. It's based on my upright position, my thoracic and hip mobility, my ankle mobility. It's dependent on so many variables, some of which you literally cannot change because this is how you were born and this is the way your, your body is structured from a posture and a limb length perspective. So we need to go with an exercise that is more fitting to your posture, your height, your weight, your limb length, all these kind of variables. And here's a good way that you can kind of pinpoint what it is. First, we have to realize what isn't a great exercise for you specifically. And if your joints hurt, that's definitely gonna be a problem. So looking at an exercise, if your joints hurt, you probably don't wanna choose that exercise because something's wrong. Either your form's really bad or this exercise just isn't great for you and it's putting sheer force and tension on the joints instead of the muscle. The next one is you don't get a pump, especially if you're in the eight, 10 or more rep range and you're after hypertrophy, you should get a pump in this exercise. Shit, sometimes even if you're doing a barbell bench press for three to five reps, which is not the, uh, let's call it the pump zone where we're doing high rep bodybuilding, it's still a range of reps that creates a lot of tension and you should still get a pump in the muscle. You should still have blood flowing to that area. Next, we can look at the mind muscle connection. Maybe you are getting a decent pump, maybe you're not getting a joint pain, but there is no mind muscle connection. You don't really feel the, the exercise training that muscle. Maybe you feel that muscle a little bit afterwards, but during the actual lift, you don't have that connection. That can be an issue. That is also something that's trained, so that's not the only thing we can look at, but you absolutely should be able to feel the muscle working and that you're intending to work while doing the movement. Next, we can look at fatigue being localized or not. So if you're doing an exercise and you go through three sets and the next day, you know, you did bench press for three sets and the next day your traps hurt, what's going on here? That's not localized fatigue, or your muscles aren't fatigued at all, but your shoulders and your tendons, your bicep tendon going from your chest into your, shoulder, your bicep and your arm, your shoulder joint, it all hurts like hell. That's not good. Your joints shouldn't hurt later on. Your, your indirect muscle group shouldn't hurt later on either. If your triceps are more sore than your bench press, you're using too much triceps, not enough bench press. If your anterior delt, the front part of your shoulder, hurts too much, you're not getting enough tension on the chest, you're getting too much on the shoulder. Even worse, something completely unrelated, like your traps, as I mentioned. If that's really sore, but nothing else is sore, and all you did was chest exercises, something is going on, and you're probably choosing the wrong chest exercises. And the last one, not progressive. If you're doing an exercise, and there's just no way for you to progress it going forward, be that through weight, or reps, or sets, or pauses, intensification techniques, it's probably not a good exercise, period, or anymore. Maybe it was and you've outgrown it and you need to change up the variation, or it just never was a good, good movement, so you've never progressed in it. And if you can't progress in it ever, it's almost wasteful and useless volume because you can't build upon it. And that's the process for getting better in the gym. So you can actually kind of simplify this by ranking it uh, by using something that Dr. Mike Isretel has coined as the SFR, so stimulus to fatigue ratio. And this is a really good way of looking at it. It's just a ratio of how stimulative is it and versus how fatiguing is it. So if I have something that is very stimulative and it's not very fatiguing, that is a great exercise for muscle growth because the fatigue isn't lingering on and causing a bunch of delayed onset muscle soreness, not any joint pain, not any neurological fatigue, but it's very stimulative. I get a, a great pump, great mind-muscle connection, I can progress the movement, and I can always feel good doing it. That is awesome. Maybe you have an exercise that's very stimulative just like that, but it's also very fatiguing, so you can't do it very often. Well, you don't wanna do that as much as something that has a low fatigue, high stimulus. Or maybe you have an exercise that you think is cool, like the deadlift. It's awesome, everybody's got a deadlift. You wanna get big, you better deadlift. And it's super, super fatiguing, but afterwards you're like, everything hurts? my whole body, my joints, my muscles, head to toe, my soul, <laughs> my heart, everything, because it just takes everything out of me because it's a deadlift. It is hard, plain and simple. It's probably not a great muscle, uh, muscle building exercise, really, because it's super fatiguing and it's fatiguing everywhere. It's not even localized. You can't get a good pump with it. You don't have a good mind-muscle connection because you're training your quads, your glutes, your hamstrings, your core, your lats, maybe your traps, everything, right? We want exercises for muscle growth that are gonna target a certain muscle group and we're gonna get after it. So if we use that deadlift as an example, once again, I'm probably not gonna use that because the SFR curve is really bad, but I might use a variation of it. I might use a stiff leg deadlift, right? And that's gonna really, really crush my hamstrings better than deadlift and any other exercise might. 
And if I still want to get my traps, I'll do shrugs. Or if I want to get my lats, I'll do pull downs. Or if I want to get some more glutes, I'll do hip abductions because the fatigue is so low, but there's a great stimulus there. So I can choose these other exercises that target all the muscle groups that the deadlift might target, but do them individually, space them out, and have much more focused and applied tension to the right muscles that I'm after instead of just draining myself entirely by doing one exercise, which perfectly goes into the next section, which is inaccurately applied tension, which is a huge red flag and common mistake we see with people as well. So if we look at misapplied tension, it's really just going to be due to either poor exercise selection or poor technique. So we kind of already covered the poor exercise selection, and a lot of times that is it. You can't apply the right tension, again, going for the biceps. Um, if I'm trying to target uh, the biceps, I need to do a bicep variation that works for me. Or I'm doing the deadlift because I want to build my hamstrings, but I'm sore everywhere. I'm going to choose a different exercise because I'm not applying the tension properly. I'm not applying my energy properly. I'm doing a deadlift that hits everything when I can apply direct tension to my hamstrings with something like the stiff leg deadlift. And I can do more volume with it because it's not as taxing and I'm not going to be hurting from it tomorrow. Right, so this idea of applied attention, applied tension is just focusing on the exact area you want to apply mechanical tension to because what builds muscle is mechanical tension. It's force, so if I have a bicep and I'm creating tension on the muscle, that tension is causing it to grow. That is the, stimulant, the stimulative response that I'm looking for. That is the actual act or, or stressor that causes growth. Now, people will often say that volume is the key to muscle growth and it is but more from a metric or measurement perspective because volume is just how much applied atten applied tension you are using so if i can create mechanical tension with a lot of intention and i'm focusing on applying it in the right areas now i can count how much of that i'm doing per session per week per month and that is my volume so volume is how you measure the tension you are applying. But if you're indirectly applying it or you're not applying it properly, you can't even measure it with the aspect of volume in the first place. So again, if we look at an example of this, when we're doing poor exercise selection and or poor form, and this could go both ways, would be a lat pull down. So a lat pull down could be uh, done incorrectly because you might not know the mechanics. So if you're not properly depressing and actually uh, adducting, your scapula so that would be depressing pulling your scapula down and adducting pulling your scapula in towards midline you're not going to be firing your lats properly because that's what they do they they adduct and abduct your torso and scapula and they depress or retract your scapula so if we think about the movement that the lats do we have to find an exercise that allows us to optimize that movement to fire the muscle properly and apply that tension maximally, right? So when you're not firing them properly, you're probably making a mistake that's gonna cause an issue with which muscle we're firing, which is gonna lead to the teres, teres major or minor, which a lot of people don't realize they're doing when they're doing lat pull downs. But again, if you don't know how your scapula moves, or maybe you don't have good thoracic mobility where you can get in an upright position that allows your scapula to drop down, um, or maybe you're using the wrong grip. Like a lot of times people will go super, super wide with a pronated grip, which is palms facing away. When a, most often you should be doing a neutral grip or even a unilateral grip, which I'll get into in a sec. And that's going to help you get in the right position better, right? So you can manipulate an exercise to accomplish this. But the Terry's pull down is something that people started using as a term instead of the lat pull down because people would go super wide and they would do a pull down but they're so wide in that pronated grip that they actually can't fully take their joints their thoracic spine their scapula all these different joints in their torso through the correct and proper range of motion to fire the muscle they're after which is the lat so now they're misapplying that tension instead of going to the lat it's going to the teres major and minor which is two tiny muscles underneath the rear delt so just below your delt you have your teres in, in major and minor, which are stacked on top of each other and actually will help your rear delts look good. So if you want to build your upper back and your rear delts, which a lot of people do, you should be training those. That's a really good thing to train. And if you're doing reverse flies of some sort, you're probably getting them a bit, but the teres pull down is a good way to get them. Most people just don't realize they're actually training their teres major and minor and not their lats, but that's because of poor technique and or body awareness and mechanics. So what you can do here is simple. Go from this grip to a neutral grip, like I said, or you can go to a unilateral grip. 
unilateral grip allows you to laterally flex your spine back and forth, which is going to help you move that scapula in a favorable uh, direction and fire your lats more. And if you've never done this, just give it a try. Try doing a single arm pull down with a neutral grip and put yourself in a position that allows you to really laterally flex your spine, almost like an oblique side crunch. And I promise you, your lats will light up like never before. It's because you're putting yourself in a, in a favorable position, which is the other thing that you can do here. So maybe you're not actually changing the exercise entirely, but you're manipulating how you're using it. That is a great way to accomplish what we're after here, which is a, applying the tension in the right area. So point being is just remember, muscle grows when tension is applied and the stimulus is great enough to cause real stress on the muscle, but it has to be on the right muscle. This stress applied is what causes muscle protein synthesis to ignite in that area, and it causes that muscle to break down, repair, rebuild, so on and so forth. That's how hypertrophy actually happens. Um, and you can accumulate all the volume you want, and your training program can look great on paper, but it's most likely junk volume if you're not following those five things properly, or you're making those five mistakes commonly within your training. So now that we know what the common mistakes are, and those again are gonna be generally just junk volume, which can kind of encompass all of these things we're talking about here, which is going to be um, suboptimal exercise performance, poor form, and misapplied tension as a whole. We can move into the five things that you need to do in order to fix the issue. So we know what is causing the red flags, what is holding you back from progressing in the gym and building muscle. Now we're gonna look at five things and actually allow you to maximize every single rep that you perform in the gym to get the most out of every rep, get the most out of every workout, and make sure that you're maximally growing muscle at an efficient rate to get to your goal body. So the first thing is gonna to be to maximize the stretch within the range of motion. There's been a lot of research as of late, I would say over the last few years, maybe several years, that shows that the stretch range of motion is the most beneficial during any movement to build muscle. And more specifically, it's actually adding load during that stretch. So you can't just sit on the ground and touch your toes and say it's a hamstring stretch and that's gonna build your muscle, but rather you have to load that. That's why a stiff leg deadlift is great. You wanna load that hamstring stretch. So when we have an overload applied to a stretched muscle or a lengthened muscle, we're gonna see more growth. They even show in specific studies, partial ranges of motion can outperform full ranges of motion. And this is most likely because you can accomplish more volume. If I only have to do half curls at the bottom, but I sit on an incline bench, I pull my shoulders back and I'm just doing that bottom quarter or bottom half of a bicep curl, I'm lengthening the muscle under load and I'm just performing a partial range of motion in that position. I could probably do twice as many reps with the same load. So I could do 10 reps with a full range of motion and still accomplish 10 overloaded stretches in that movement pattern, or I could do 20 reps with a partial range of motion and I can actually accomplish 20 overloaded partial range of motion movements in that bottom range. Technically, based on research as we have now, it shows that the stretched portion, that smaller quarter to a half rep would actually be more beneficial. Now, I don't think there's enough research to show that that's always applicable. And I also don't believe that the shortened range of a muscle group or the, the ending of a, a range of motion is negligible. It's not useful. It's, it's going to hurt your progress. It's, it's there for a reason. It's going to help us move forward no matter what. And I think there's a lot of concentric uh, benefits. So concentric being that shortening of the muscle. And I think more research will be telling to see how beneficial it actually is. But there's a reason why even the most evidence-based trainers like myself or researchers who are actually studying this stuff still do full ranges of motion while just emphasizing that lengthened portion, which is what we're going to really get to here. Because one of the, the easiest ways to take advantage of this is just to accentuate that eccentric. So that negative um, during that range of motion, when it's a stretched base movement, or adding a pause during the stretch range of any range of motion. So in the bottom of a bench press, when your pecs are fully stretched, pause there. Um, or even specifically choosing exercises, or again, manipulating exercises to favor that stretch portion. So again, if we know that we need to be doing a full range of motion, and we can be targeting the stretch portion, the lengthened range of that movement pattern and emphasizing that with load to build more muscle, we should probably accentuate that or exaggerate our stretch or pause during the stretch, do something, manipulate the exercise in order to favor 
that portion of the range of motion to optimize growth. Um, and three examples of this, again, are really simple. We can accentuate eccentrics, which would just mean going a little bit slower in that bottom range. Again, using something like a bench press, for example, I could use a different bar or dumbbells and I can accentuate the negative by going deeper and actually slowing down towards the bottom range. So I'm spending more time under that stretched base tension at the bottom of that movement. Um, number two, I could pause at that stretch. So maybe I just go with a normal tempo because I don't want to count and I go to the bottom of that bench press and I just pause and hold a, a deep stretch at the bottom with load during that bench press. I'm accomplishing the same thing here. And the third way would be choosing or manipulating exercise to enhance a stretch. So maybe I don't want to do a regular bench press. Maybe I do a cambered bar bench press, which is one of my favorite bars to use for this. It's bent. And so when I go to the bottom of my chest, the load is actually lower than my body would be because it's in a curved position. So I can get a extended range of motion to enhance that stretch. Or maybe I change my position, like I said, on the lat pull down. Maybe I'm gonna torque my body, position myself in a certain way, use a single arm grip, and I'm gonna do all these things so that I can just emphasize that stretch at the top of every single rep. Either way, I'm either choosing an exercise specifically for the stretch, or I'm manipulating the exercise to uh, exaggerate that stretch during the range of motion. Nonetheless, the first big tip here to maximizing every rep, every set, every exercise, and ultimately maximizing muscle growth is to emphasize the stretch portion of your ranges of motion during your strength training. Next, we have to attack the red flag of poor effort. Most people just do not train hard enough. We know this based on research and being a coach for over 10 years and working with thousands of people at this point, I can tell you a lot of people just do not train hard enough. So uh, we know based on research that we need to get within three reps of failure. I would venture on the side of one to two because if somebody doesn't know how to train to failure, it's very unlikely that when they say they're three reps away from failure, that they're actually three reps away from failure. The more advanced you get, the more accurate your, your ranking intuitively will be. Um, but until then, you need to be using the RIR scale. So the RIR scale stands for reps in reserve. There's the RPE scale as well, which is rate of perceived exertion, which is great. It's in the inverse. So a RIR of two would be an RPE of eight. But most people are going to do better with the RIR scale. I think it's more applicable to hypertrophy and it's just easier to understand. Now, you could just do an RIR of two or one, two, and three across all your sets. Maybe you just target RIR two across everything. On paper, that's fine. You're within three reps of failure. Those will all be stimulative and you should be able to progress. In fact, some people like to play it safe and do this because if you're at a two RIR, you leave enough in the tank to improve each week. And that's great, but you're not quite pushing the limits. And I think part of training and discovering what failure looks like is pushing the limits in the gym and getting after it and challenging yourself. So although it might be safer and it might look fine on paper, I find that going to failure on a, a lot of exercises is actually really beneficial. Again, we might not want to do this on the compound lifts like a back squat, but on a lunge or a row or a lateral raise or a curl or a hip thrust or anything, you know, that you are safe, you are not going to hurt yourself. I think you should use this descending RIR scale and you should go all the way to zero RIR, which is failure. And on the safe, the lifts that you have to worry about safety and have a higher injury risk, squat, leg press, deadlift, bench press, maybe you go three, two, one, one, instead of going all the way to failure, play it safe and still make it stimulative. On your isolation exercises, go all the way down to zero. You're going to learn a lot and it's going to help you in the rest of your training, especially when you're using the RIR scale. Another big issue we see is this exercise selection being uh, choosing exercises that are unfavorable for hypertrophy because it doesn't properly apply the tension because you are putting yourself in an unstable position, right? You're unstable, which means your body has to create stability, which requires other muscle groups. It requires strength, balance, and coordination. So you're thinking about stuff. Right? So if you're doing a squat on a BOSU ball, how on earth is that going to be productive for anything? You know, we see basketball players do this, but you don't see basketball players playing on a court while an earthquake's going on. No, it's a hard floor. It's flat. It's a surface that already has stability. You're creating force, power, strength on a stable surface. So you should train with a stable surface. But uh, athletes aside, if we're talking about hypertrophy here, it's the same thing. So instead of using these functional bodybuilding exercises where you're in a half kneeling position, maybe doing like half racked, half kneeling, Arnold press, and you got all this stuff going on, right? You're, you're trying to avoid anti-rotation, anti-lateral rotation, hip stability, half kneeling position, tension on your heel. There is just so much going on. You can't overload the muscle because you got all this other tension being applied elsewhere and your brain's thinking about five different things at once. Instead, sit on a bench with a back support 
use a machine or a single dumbbell and just push the weight, right? Better yet, grab a rack and hold that for balance while you push the weight. If we can overload the muscle and just prioritize that muscle, we're gonna get more out of every exercise. So three examples of this, and, and again, this whole tip right here of how to maximize this is just choosing stable exercises instead of ones that are unstable, where you are required to create the stability, is uh, the first exercise that I would suggest making a swap for in this case, or to give you a good example, would be a standing overhead press for a seated machine press, be that a hammer strength or something like a Smith machine. So instead of me standing up and overpressing a weight while having to keep my core, my trunk very stiff, which again, it's a great functional exercise. I also think that the overhead press is great because it just shows like really just man strength. There's no better way to put it. A dude who can press a lot of weight over his head, that is a strong guy and it is impressive. I think it's dope. I like the overhead press, but if I'm trying to really isolate and build my shoulders, I'm gonna choose a machine press. I'm gonna sit down doing it. I don't gotta stand up. I don't gotta worry about my feet. I don't have to worry about my core bracing. I don't have to worry about my back hyperextending too much. I can just press the weight overhead. In fact, I can even angle the bench a little bit so I don't have to be perfectly erect with my spine and worry about even more trunk stiffness even though I'm in a seated position. So again, swap out the standing overhead press for a seated machine press if you wanna isolate the shoulders. Another one would be switching out a high bar back squat, which is a great exercise for something like a leg press or a hack squat machine. If you suffer with uh, poor mobility in your ankles or your hips or your thoracic spine, or you find that your low back gets sore or your core has to do a lot of work or your shoulder mobility is not the best, so it's hard to rack the bar, all these things are limiting factors to applying hypertrophy on your quads uh, if you're after quad growth. So if you're after quad growth, go on a leg press or a hack squat machine where you can tweak your form perfectly and just focus on your quads. And the third exercise that I would give as a, a, a way to use as an example of a swap is a standing chest fly for a seated chest fly. Um, you can do this with a cable machine. You could also do this with a pec deck machine. But either way, instead of me standing, having to lean forward, worry about getting a good, stable, staggered position and leaning into it with my core brace to make sure I don't fall back when the weight pulls me or being limited on how much weight I can use because if I go too heavy, it does pull me back. I'm gonna get a bench that is anchored to the floor and it ain't moving anywhere be that a pec deck or a cable machine that I move a bench to, and I'm just gonna do flies. I'm gonna be seated, I'm gonna have to worry about standing, bouncing, core strength, I'm just gonna do the fly, stretch the muscle, contract the muscle, overload the muscle, and I'm gonna get way more out of it. All right, next tip or item that we have to cover when we think of progressing your training and just getting the most out of everything you do, and this is gonna be number four, is gonna be progressing your volume over the course of weeks. Um, we know that volume is the main driver for hypertrophy, or at least that's what m most people say. I would, I would change that up and say it's the main measurement for the driver of hypertrophy. As I mentioned earlier, the main driver of hypertrophy is mechanical tension, and we need to apply that tension properly. But volume is how we track this. So if we are going to progressively overload, specifically for hypertrophy, which is what periodization and progressive uh, methods are all about, right? We need to improve implement a method of programming that allows us to progress our training with hypertrophy it's specifically with the applied tension so it's not just about adding weight to the bar it's about increasing the amount total amount of applied tension so volume as a metric for hypertrophy is increasing the total amount of applied tension on a muscle or many muscles every week every month until we reach our goal and there's three ways to do this the first one is linear progressions uh, for the loads that you're lifting. This is exactly how you would do it with the strength. And technically it works for hypertrophy too. So if we start with an exercise doing three sets of 10, next week we do three sets of eight, and then the week after that we do three sets of six. We dropped the reps by two every single week. So volume actually lowers, but intensity went up because what I can do for eight is more than I can do for 10, which means when I went from 10 to eight, although I dropped volume on a rep perspective, I increased intensity from a load perspective. And if we do 200 pounds and then the next week 205 pounds, we just do the math three times 10 times 200 versus three times eight times 205. Typically what this leads to is more total volume from a tonnage perspective. And even when it doesn't, it's gonna allow you to get a little bit stronger. And then guess what? On week four, we come back to three sets of 10 and now we're doing 205 for 10 instead of 200. So that is more applied tension and volume over time. We can use this on our compound lifts. The second way, is to just add one to two sets per week per session per muscle. So if I am doing 10 total sets of chest per week and I decide it's time for a bump up in my volume, I'm just gonna go to push day one and I'm gonna look at my bench press. I'm gonna take it from three sets to four sets. I'm gonna look at my chest fly and take that from three sets to four sets. Now I added two sets of chest training per week 
in that adjustment, right? In that first day, and that's all I'm gonna do. And then maybe next time I'm bouncing out the volumes so the next time I make an adjustment or at the same exact time, maybe I add a set of pull downs and a set of straight arm pull downs. So now I have uh, more vertical pulls and more straight arm pull downs, both of which add two sets to my lats. Either way, I'm spacing this out over the course of weeks or over the course of muscle groups. And I'm doing it in a fashion that is progressively adding volume via sets over time. And the third way is to increase frequency in the muscle that you're trying to grow. So maybe this means that you are doing an upper lower split, but on your second lower day, you throw some lateral raises in. So you go upper, lower, upper, lower, plus lateral raises. And at the end of your leg day, you throw in some lateral raises. Maybe you do it in your warm up even. Either way, you are adding volume to that muscle group by just increasing the frequency. Because now you're not just hitting it two days a week with your upper days, but you're hitting it a third day for the week, which adds to your total volume applied to the shoulders on a weekly basis. Really, really simple. Linear progression with the load you're lifting, add one to two sets per session, per muscle, per week, or increase the frequency you're training the muscle, which in turn does the same thing as the other ones. You're adding volume over time. And the last thing that we need to focus on when we are trying to correct these mistakes and we are trying to maximize everything we do in the gym to maximally stimulate muscle growth is take longer rest periods. Uh, we just want to maximize volume per set. It's really simple. Research suggests that we should be resting longer so that we can fully recover. A lot of times people take too short of rest periods and what's happening here is they are still metabolically fatigued. So their heart is pumping, they're breathing hard. They haven't fully recovered from a metabolic perspective, a cardiovascular perspective, an aerobic perspective. This is why cardio during gaining phases still can be helpful and applicable. But if you don't have a good cardio system, then you're not gonna recover very quickly. And even with people who have a good aerobic system, they're still not gonna recover from a heavy squat, bench, even a chest fly or something like that as an isolation exercise immediately. So jumping right back into the exercise is gonna cause your volume by uh, to drop by your low dropping. You're not gonna be able to complete as much weight or as many reps as you did in the previous set because you're metabolically fatigued. The other thing is that you still might have localized uh, fatigue and tension. So if I do a chest fly and my chest is pumped and burnt out, I need to allow that lactate or uh, most people think of it as lactic acid to actually dissipate, to leave the muscle, to calm down a little bit. Let me get some of the tension out of the muscle so that it can calm down. I can rest my aerobic system and then I can come back and do it with the same load and accomplish the same amount of volume. So here's a rubric for you to follow. It's just some really general, straightforward rest periods for you to follow to make sure you're getting the best rest periods inside your training. You're doing a compound lift or something that is a, a heavy high risk lift. So leg press, deadlift, bench, squat, stuff like that. You wanna want to rest at least two minutes, but upwards of five minutes. I usually find people do best with that three to four minute range. Not too long, but definitely not too short. In other words, if you don't have a timer, you can just wait till your heart rate calms down and you're, you're not breathing super hard anymore. And these are the most important ones to give yourself enough rest on. These are the biggest lifts. The next one is accessory lifts. So think of your rows, lunges, other presses like dumbbell presses, chest presses, stuff like that. We wanna rest um, at least one and a half minutes, but most likely two to three minutes. So anywhere between one and a half to three minutes when we're doing a pull down, we're doing a chest press, a lunge, something like that, an accessory exercise. Moving into isolation exercises, we need to rest at least one minute, but upwards of two minutes. This would be your hip abductions, your bicep curls, lateral raises. Give yourself at least a minute, but most likely it's a smaller muscle, it's less weight lifted, it's gonna recover far faster than you will from a heavy back squat. And then last but not least, when you're performing something like a superset, for example, you're gonna rest between 30 seconds and a minute between A and B. So if you're doing a push-pull superset, you're gonna do the push, rest 30 seconds to a minute before the pull, or virtually not at all, because by the time you move from that first exercise to the next one, get set up, get ready, grip the bar, pull it off the rack, it's probably gonna be at least 30 seconds anyway. So virtually none, but about 30 seconds to a minute. Then you're gonna rest a solid two to four minutes before returning back to A. So you go push, go right into pull, then rest two to four minutes before you come back to push to start the superset again. And there you have it. Use these five strategies to maximize every single exercise you do in the gym to get the most out of every rep you do in the gym. And just make sure that you really pay attention for those red flags. If you're training alone, you're following an online program like we have in the app, shameless plug, Taylor Trainer. But if you're following something like that and you don't have a trainer right next to you, you need to be accountable to yourself. You need to make sure that you're looking at what you're doing and you're making sure that you're not making those mistakes by choosing the wrong exercises. You're, you're being a baby in the gym and you're not pushing it hard enough. Or maybe you're just misapplying the tension. You're not thinking about where the soreness is actually ending up. 
Think about those things, call yourself out when you do them, and then use these five strategies to eliminate those red flags. But more importantly, maximize every rep, maximize every exercise, and maximize every single workout in the gym. Because if you're spending hours in the gym every week, you deserve to actually look like you work out.